Dr. Beckler is an orthopedic surgeon. He's also the orthopedic consultant for Princeton University. And Dr. Beckler uh, completed his talk at the very final moment to make sure that he was had the most up-to-date evidence-based information for the talk. Eric asked me to speak uh, this morning to you all about the uh, management and the myths of patellofemoral injury. And rather than go through a whole bunch of different injuries to the patellofemoral joint, I thought we would focus on traumatic patella dislocations because they seem to be a common uh, occurrence in the high school and college population and the people that you all treat on a regular basis. I have no disclosures. Um, the objectives are to, by the end of this presentation, be able to review the re relevant anatomy of the knee with particular attention to the patellofemoral joint, to comprehend the indications for operative management of the patellofemoral instability in the skeletally mature patient, and to confirm or refute some common myths regarding patellofemoral injury and treatment. So again, we're, we're going to be concentrating on dislocations of the, uh, of the patella. So myth number one is, and we'll, we'll go over these at the end to make sure we understand, because I figure three facts per talk is about all anybody can handle. I could only do two facts when I was growing up, but I figure you guys, it's more than time, you can do three. So the three take home messages. So the first one is myth number one. An athlete with two previous patella dislocations has a 50% chance of sustaining a third one. Myth number two, return to sports following a, an MPFL, a medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction, averages three to six months. And myth number three, these could all be true or false, recurrent patella dislocations are associated with, patella, with patient patellofemoral malalignment. So just quickly, a little bit about a history of a patella dislocation, how it happens. The incidence is about six per 100,000 uh, persons, and it may or may not involve contact. It's associated with immediate pain and swelling, and it may spontaneously reduce with the knee extension. Sometimes the patients will say, my kneecap went to the side, and when I went to straighten it out, it just popped back in, which is not an unusual scenario. Sometimes they present to the emergency room, and there are uh, medical personnel there who are going to help the situation. Uh, this is a patient, obviously, who's got a patella dislocation, and you know he's got a little anxiety. You can see his hands over his eyes. You can see he's got a, a, a emesis basin in his hand that they've given him to get him ready for the reduction. And you'll see as we move forward in the in the video that he starts to hyperventilate as the medical staff tries to struggle to put the patella back in position. I wouldn't necessarily say this is the best way to do it. He's not working on getting his knee the knee extended. If you just extend the knee, it'll pop in by itself. So there's a little bit of struggling going on. And obviously, this is not the first time the medical guy has done this because he gave him the uh, emesis basin. Ouch. All right, so that was good. But, but the concept is that it does go back in, but if you just extend the knee, it will go back in. You don't have to push on it. You just extend the knee, and it pops back in. All right, so the diagnosis on exam when they come to our office or when you see them after being on the field is they may have a hemarthrosis, they're tender over the medial retinaculum because that's what they tear, and their lateral femoral condyle is also tender. They have apprehension when you try to uh, shift their patella laterally just with direct pressure on the medial retinaculum and try to, to reproduce the mechanism of injury. Um, sometimes they have mechanical symptoms with a loose body if they've had it for a couple of days, but but really, sometimes the, the, the most difficult thing to do is to determine whether someone has torn their ACL or whether they have a patella dislocation. And I also find that hard when they come to the office after three, four, five days. They have a big hemarthrosis or on crutches. They were playing soccer. You know, it's hard to tell, right? But the best thing that I can do is, is try to recreate the mechanism. I try to push on their medial retinaculum and try to push their patella laterally over the edge. And if they have apprehension and they have pain there, then they, they likely dislocated their patella. Because you really can't you know, get a Lachman or get any ligament exam on those people. So ligamentous anatomy, when somebody tears, or when somebody, uh, excuse me, dislocates their patella, is that they, they injure their medial uh, patella from a ligament. And the center picture there shows the anatomic uh, dissection in a cadaver where the, uh, the snap here is, is, is located right at the insertion of the MPFL, which is kind of fan-like 
and, and broad face, uh, broad attachment, and then back at the at the femur, and near the attachment here, it, it goes more to a more concentrated uh, point. The MPFL is the uh, primary static re restraint to lateral subluxation. It contributes about 50 to 60 percent of restraint at zero to 30 degrees of knee flexion. People ask, what's the most uh, uh, dynamic restraint, it's obviously the VMO. That's what we work on for rehabbing these patients because that's what we can address. Bony anatomy, there's not a whole lot of time to spend on that other to say that the medial facet is the portion of the patella that takes the biggest hit when the patella dislocates. And when there's an osteochondral fragment or fracture or bruising of the articular surface, it's the medial facet of the patella that's involved. So here's a patient who has a dislocation of their patella. It has not yet been reduced. And you can see on the merchant view, or the position that they took the x-ray in, you can see the uh, patella is off to the side. So when the, when the patella is reduced and we get an MRI scan and we look for the injury to the medial structures, you can see right here the intrasubstance injury to the um, MPFL or the medial patellofemoral ligament in these three pictures up top. It's all the same uh, picture. And then sometimes the ligament will, will tear at the femoral insertion down by the red arrow here. And this is to be differentiated from an injury to the medial collateral ligament, which on the coronal MRI scan is where the blue arrow attaches to the adductor tubercle. So these, these insertion sites of the medial collateral ligament and the MPFL are very close to each other, but they're distinct in their appearance on an MRI scan. So the natural history of someone who dislocates their patella, what happens to them? Well, they say Fithian did a study in 2004, and he said approximately 15% will re-dislocate uh, again. Other studies have predicted as high as 30% re-dislocation rate of a primary dislocator. After a second dislocation, the risk of a subsequent dislocation is 50%, according to Wang in his research on 2016. So someone, a, a kid in high school has had two, the chances of getting a third is 50%. So there was a prospective study of 189 patients to identify the fine risk factors for subsequent dislocation and, you know, no surprise, it's female gender and a history of previous dislocation. So what do we do for a primary dislocation? The majority of, of people out there, primary dislocation is a non-operative treatment. So conservative treatment involves Physical therapy, you can quadricep and VMO strengthening, stretching of the IT band, lateral retinaculum. Everybody has their own recipe and formula to try to, to rehab a, a, a patella dislocation to uh, get them back to play again. Um, and then frequently we'll put them in a patella stabilizing brace, something that has like a lateral support, helps with alignment. And uh, if we look at a study, performed by Mose in 2018, which was a systemic review, I'm sorry, systematic review of all the different evidence out there as to what is the best way to treat a uh, patella dislocation, primarily to prevent recurrence. We find that there's a lack of any quality evidence to advocate for the use of any particular non-operative technique, and that the bottom line is you're going to get a 30% recurrence rate no matter how you treat it. So personally, I put them in an immobilizer for a month, let things cool down, then I start them on a rehab program, and as soon as they're ready to go back, meet their functional ability to, to do one-legged hops and do agilities, I put them in a brace and let them go back and play. But it's no different if you have a different protocol. So then that's what that's thinking. So should we be operating for first-time dislocators? Because there's a 30% chance they're going to re-dislocate. So there was a systematic review regarding primary versus uh, primary operative treatment of a primary dislocator versus non-operative treatment. And interestingly, the surgery group had a lower rate of re-dislocation of only 24% versus 34%. There was no difference in the function outcomes as the patients uh, filled out their forms as to how well they were doing with their with their knee. And the patients who had or had surgery had an increase in, in arthritis uh, down the road. So then you're looking at, well, is it beneficial to operate on a first-time dislocator when you're only decreasing the rate of re-dislocation from 34 to 24? So the, the general consensus is to operate on multiple dislocations. 
when there's a patient who has an inability to return to sport, and of course, if there's a large loose body or osteochondral uh, fracture, typically from the patella, we'll operate on a first time dislocator who has that associated injury. An osteochondral lesion happens about 5% of the time, according to the literature. It's seen on the MRI scan in, in figure number A here. You can see it right here where the arrow is. This is on the medial, off the medial facet of the patella in the, the typical location. Frequently, they say it happens when the, when the patella is reduced, when it goes back in, as opposed to when it goes out, although it's hard to document that. In slide B here, you can see the repair of the osteochondral uh, fragment or fracture. The two little white arrows, you can see there's these two little thumbtacks. We use absorbable tacks to tack this back into the bony bed. And the only way you can get at that is to do an arthrotomy incision in the knee on the side of the, of the kneecap here, and we flip the kneecap and invert it 180 degrees so it's looking up at the ceiling so we can put the piece back in. And then we have to put it you know, back down. And then if we do this, then we will typically repair the medial retinaculum at the time, as well as the uh, medial patella from a ligament if it was torn off of the patella. So if we look at risk factors for redislocation, we look at, well, so, so why are people redislocating after we fix their medial patellofemoral ligament. And the reason for that is because that their medial patellofemoral ligament was not the reason for them dislocating in the first place. Right, that, got, that was torn at the time of the dislocation. But the reason for their dis, dislocation is frequently an alignment problem. So we look at external tibial torsion and the Q angle. We look at patella alta. We look at trochlear dysplasia. I mean, look at overall ligament laxity as a, as a reason for patients to be prone to redislocation or recurrent dislocations. So in the office, when we're trying to assess a patient to determine if they need to have surgery to prevent redislocation, we, we do a number of imaging studies to evaluate their alignment. And different surgeons use different types of imaging studies, but they frequently look at the patella and how it's seated in the groove. You know, this patella is sitting nice in the middle of the groove here. This one's laterally displaced. This one's not even close. Uh, we measure the, the patella tilt um, years ago. Uh, used to probably some of the older guys out there might notice that they were doing a lot of lateral releases. So arthroscopic lateral release was a common procedure for orthopedic surgeons to do for patients who had patella instability of a recurrent nature. And basically, we would look for somebody who had this type of an x-ray, and we would just say, oh, they had a tight lateral retinaculum, and we would go in and just cut this off as a way of treating their instability. Um, obviously, people aren't doing a lot of that now, so that means it probably didn't work. Um, again, we look at congruence angles. We look at the sulcus of the, uh, of the femoral trochlea. And one of the more common things that we look at for, al for al alignment is the ratio here between the uh, tibial tuberosity, which you can see in the background here. When we look at the distance uh, measured between the tibial tuberosity and a perpendicular and the center of the trochlear groove. It's called the TT versus TG ratio, or what is the distance between the two. And as you can see, this, as the tibial tuberosity external rotates and moves in this direction, that would increase your Q angle and they also make a larger number between the TG and TT. So the way we standardize this is we use a CAT scan to measure it on patients. As seen here, 15 millimeters is normal and 20 millimeters is considered uh, abnormal and, and we would consider a distal realignment procedure for someone who had recurrent dislocations. So on a CAT scan, again, we look at these two, two numbers. Perpendicular is drawn right between the center of the trochlear groove, which you can see is also hypoplastic in this patient. And then we also look at the center of the tibia tubercle, and then we measure that distance. So there was an interesting article in 2015 that was out, out there looking at the, at the uh, different, uh, at the incidence of the of redislocation in patients who had certain alignment abnormalities. And column P here is, is uh, patella alta. Uh, Q here is uh, the TT, TG uh, interval, or the Q, the Q angle, and, and on. And, and the, the most uh, 
the highest incidence for recurrence of a patella dislocation had to do with patients who had patella alta and uh, trochlear dysplasia, but also, you know, 40% uh, recurrence in someone who had a, a Q angle of more than 20 was also uh, significant. So these are all of the different reasons that patients will be prone to redislocation, and it's due to, th due to their alignment. So quickly going through some operative treatment that we do to address injuries of the, of the patella. We have the MPFL procedure, which is the basically becoming the gold standard for treatment because of the injury that it, it happened at the time of the uh, event. We will repair the MPFL uh, if we're there already to repair the uh, an osteochondral injury, uh, typically performed, as we note down here, the reconstruction has become more popular as a way to uh, stabilize the patella and pre prevent re-injury. But if you think about it, if the MPFL is what's torn at the time of the patella dislocation, and then you reconstruct the ligament, all you're really doing is restoring the anatomy that the patient had prior to the patella dislocation. You're not realigning their patellofemoral mechanism, and you're not really making it so they're less likely to dislocate. You're just repairing the structure that was torn at the time of the initial patella dislocation. So what does the return to play say for someone who has a MPFL reconstruction? Well, the average return to play is about five months. I would say five to six months following a Telephermal reconstruction, but for a MPFL reconstruction, excuse me. Um, however, recurrent dislocations are still about 12% when operating on the MPFL. There's a 27% redislocation rate when they're just repairing the structure, the suturing it back together, and there's a 6.6 uh, re recurrent uh, dislocation rate for an MPFL reconstruction. There was a review article recently in 2014 for guidelines for medial patellofemoral ligament reconstructions in chronic lateral patella instability, and the complication rate was as high as 26%. And the reason for that is because of the difficulty in, in, in teaching surgeons as to where to put the reconstructed ligament. And mostly it has to do with insertion site on the femur being extremely important. You can see on the picture here on the right, those little red dots are places that surgeons can put the ligament insertion, but the middle is exactly where it needs to go. And it's off by just a little bit, a couple of mil millimeters. It, it trans, um, transmits into a tremendous amount of uh, uh, different forces that are placed on the patella through range of motion, and you'll exchange a, a more stable patella to one that, that hurts more. So this, this is a schema that shows the red as you start to get put too much tension on the ligament as the knee goes through range of motion. So the MPFL works well to decrease the recurrence to some degree, but it doesn't address some of the pathology which occurs with the patella dislocation. So perhaps we need to consider other anatomic factors to try to prevent recurrence. And this is where a distal realignment or fulcrum uh, has become popular. It was introduced back in the 1980s by a surgeon named Fulkerson, not surprisingly. And it's a way to realign the, uh, the extensor mechanism to decrease the Q angle and to more uh, directly affect the extensor mechanism to uh, prevent patella instability and, and dislocation. The procedure is performed by actually moving the t or rotating the tibial tuberosity. So an incision is made, it's actually cut, and then you rotate the attachment of the patella tendon on the tibia tubercle so that it comes into a more straight line fashion. So instead of being over here externally rotated, you osteotomize the attachment and rotate it and move it over this way so then it's now in a straight line. So if this was normal and this is the way 
your patient is, you're trying to make it look this way. So the alignment of the extensor mechanism is more in direct line to keep the patella in the groove. It'll decrease your Q angle and it will also anteriorize your patella at the same time if you do it correctly, which decreases the shear forces on the patella through range of motion. So what's return to play after a fulcrum? I don't know if any of you have ever had kids who've had distal patella tendon, I mean, I'm sorry, if you ever had a fulcrum osteotomy uh, student athlete return to play? Probably not that common, right? Um, largest case series, 41 patients, and he said they had, he had 97% return to pre-injury sport. So then the final operative treatment for uh, patella dislocations to work on is a new one, which is called a, a trochlearplasty, which basically is surgery to address the abnormal trochlea of the femur. I can't get this to go backwards. Oh well. So the problem, or the, the interesting, the, the technical demand on this is to take a flat trochlea and try to make it into a groove and not kill the articular cartilage at the same time. So you're trying to create something like this. It use absorb absorbable sutures are used and um, it's really more of a salvage procedure at this time. It doesn't necessarily is not being used at all to get athletes back on the uh, on the playing field but there is some promise to think that perhaps in the future uh, we might be able to better stabilize the patellofemoral joint by deepening the groove somehow and giving the patella a better place to ride so there are four major anatomic factors contributing to patella instability we have the patella alta we have q angle we have trochlear dysplasia, and then we have overall ligamentous laxity. Preoperative considerations include the patient's functional status as well as anatomic alignment factors. The MPFL reconstruction is the workhorse of patellofemoral instability surgery because it seems to be something that we can repair and reconstruct easily. But the real question is, is this good for the patient and is it going to really have any long-term benefit for them? Uh, tibial tubercle osteotomies, especially the fulcrosins, are effective procedures to limit recurrence and allow return to play, but there's not a lot of surgeons out there who do this as a first-line treatment for someone with a chronic patella dislocation. And then trochlearplasty is an evolving operation that may add to the treatment of patellofemoral instability in the future. So if we go back to our myths from the beginning, it's an athlete with two previous patella dislocations had a 50% chance of sustaining a third one? The answer is true. Myth number two, return to sports following an MPFL reconstruction averages five to six months. That's true. And myth number three, recurrent patella dislocations are associated with patient patellofemoral malalignment. And that is true. Thank you. Anybody have questions for Dr. Becker? Should we be working up all dislocations for a telephemoral lesion? Just repeat the question, please. Thank you. Should we be, the question was, should we be working up all patella dislocations for a patella lesion, like an osteochondral fracture? I think that's a very good question. I, I think that um, historically the answer was I didn't. But as time goes on, I do. And so there's very few patients who come in with a patella dislocation who I don't work up to make sure they don't have an osteochondral lesion. I think you can get a, key, uh, a little bit of a clue on some patients with an x-ray. If you look carefully, you can see a little fleck of bone that may um, guide you to investigate it further. But I think uh, it seems to be that the standard of care these days is to evaluate a dislocated a dislocation of a patella with an MRI scan to evaluate for an osteochondral lesion. You don't find it very much though, like I said, about 5% of the time, but we, but we do get MRI scans. Other questions? When it comes to <clears throat> um, patellar femoral alignment, do you ever look at putting, um, especially kids who are still growing, into an orthotic to um, 
get their back into alignment and decrease that external rotation of the tibia? Uh, the question was, do we a skeletally immature uh, patient who's developing some patella femoral malalignment, do we put them in braces to try to minimize that? And the answer is more of an orthotic. Orthotic in their shoe? Uh, no, we, ha we haven't been doing that and we haven't seen any literature that supports using orthotics for that. There was a period of time where, where um, orthopedists used to put patients in, in bars and braces in their lower legs due to lower extremity you know, malalignments, but we don't, we don't do that anymore either.